back in 2019, I reviewed the first omnibus of the Boogie Pop Phantom no or Boogie Pop novels around the time that that year's anime series adapting a couple of novels had wrapped up. Well, I've finally gotten around to watching Boogie Pop Phantom from 2000. It's a very before I review Boogie Pop Phantom, it bears giving my thoughts on the 2019 series since I watched the 2019 series, or rather, giving my thoughts in video form. Boogie Pop and Others is, in a way, the first Boogie Pop anime adaptation, though it is not the first Boogie Pop series in general. 2000 saw live action adaptations of the first novel and the original series Boogie Pop Phantom the latter of which I'm going to be reviewing in the not-too-distant future. The latter series is an original story and assumes some prior novel novels as those were very popular in Japan and inspired a number of works that sought to emulate it, in, if not the exact subject matter, then at least tone and feel. Now, in the U.S., this served as something of a barrier to the series' success, particularly compared to other series which, again, were totally similar but were not dependent on prior knowledge of that source material, like Serial Experiments Lane. So until 2019, there weren't, we didn't have any anime adaptation of the novels, and that bears mentioning, as of 2019, the modern market for translated light novels in the English-speaking world is still relatively, or was still relatively new. Yeah, we got... Tokyo Pop's translated release of the Slayers novels, but a big chunk of that dried up when Tokyo Pop and ADV manga went under. Indeed, it is serendipitous that the novels were licensed somewhat contemporaneously with the 2019 series, and I'm going to get around to the second omnibus eventually. Boogie Pop and Others is an adaptation of the first five or so of the Boogie Pop novels. As the second and third books are two halves of the same story, this makes for about four stories in total. This covers the adaptation of the first novel in versus Imaginator, which I covered in my previous review of the first omnibus. And the other stories include Boogie Pop at Dawn, which has the origins of Boogie Pop, and finally, King of Distortion, which is probably the biggest challenge Boogie Pop has faced over the course of the series. As with the novels, while Boogie Pop is the title character, they are never the viewpoint character. We only see Boogie Pop through the perspective of third parties, and we don't even see Boogie Pop from the perspective of their other self, uh, Toka Mayashita. There's a blessing and a curse for the series. Toka is a just bright, cheerful, and generic enough that she slips under the radar most of the time. Um, so consequently, her presence becomes much more noticeable and grabs the audience's attention when Boogie Pop shows up. And the impact of that varies from the books to the TV series. In the novels, particularly with the English translation, it's understated. The weight of the shift varies from different viewpoint characters and how well they notice that Toka's acting a little differently, talking a little differently, that sort of thing. Now, in the anime... Because there's a clearly audible vocal shift, it becomes much more pronounced. As I mentioned back in the Omnibus review, Three years ago, Link in the Doobie Doo, um, I compare it to the transition between Bruce Wayne doing his regular voice and Batman's voice. On the page, it doesn't come across unless in the or comics and Batman, the difference in voice doesn't come across until the artist and inker do something to call attention to the difference. To means the or in this case also the letterer do something to call attention to the difference with changes in word balloons, lettering typeface choice, that sort of thing. With Kevin Conroy, on the other hand, the difference is very clear from the acting decision level. As with the books, the antagonists in the anime alternate between superpowered murderers like Manticore and thematic enemies like Imaginator. They aren't a rogues gallery by any means. Instead of existing to be a threat to Boogie Pop, they are 
much more of a threat to the viewpoint characters. In this respect, Boogie Pop and the various view audience perspective characters or point of view characters are comparable to Walter Gibson's The Shadow novels from back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. In those novels, Harry Vincent, one of the Shadow's agents, is the primary viewpoint character. Often the novels will shift to other viewpoint characters as they put together the pieces of the plot of that novel's villain, only occasionally shifting to the Shadow. Even then, on those instances, the Shadow was, himself was not generally a viewpoint character and rarely was personally in danger. Instead, Harry Vincent or another agent were the ones who were more often in peril. It's the same thing here. With a couple of exceptions, Boogie Pop is never personally in peril. The viewpoint characters are. Now, they're usually not hapless hostages in waiting, but they're also not quite the force of nature that Boogie Pop is, or relative force of nature that Boogie Pop is. It makes the supporting cast a lot more engaging and keeps the plot moving without having to have Boogie Pop always be present. All of that said, I do wish that Toka was written more as a character instead of set dressing that Boogie Pop occasionally just pops out of. It leads to this feeling now, on the one hand, it leaves the feeling that our point of view characters have figured out that Toka is Boogie Pop, but know it, and they're hanging around with her as a weird crap sounding board. Which means that they talk about something weird, and Boogie Pop pops up and chimes in, and they know they're onto something. That said, with the as much as with the novels as well as this TV show, there's no sense that Toka has an inner life. Not to mention, in between 20, 2019 and as of this recording, um, and also when this comes out, we've gotten Moon Knight, the television series, where on the one hand, that show has a dichotomy shift between the quiet, unassuming Stephen Grant and Mark Spector, and we see the shifts over the course of the series, and the two characters are in dialogue with each other, they're aware of each other, um, eventually. Um, it provides a definite sense of, okay, Stephen is a person who has a point of view on things, on the weird crap happening all around him. Um, with Toka, there's like, she takes part in conversations, that sort of thing, but we never really a sense of what she really thinks. Like what she thinks. There's never an episode that is strictly Toka's point of view and like blinks out or blacks out in the middle of a conversation. Then. Like, huh? Um, are you saying something? None of that when, when Boogie Pop chips into Voice's perspective. It would be nice to have gotten her point of view, how she thinks of how she thinks of Boogie Pop, if she knows that Boogie Pop is riding around with her. Um, indeed, if she's again, like if she's aware of a Boogie Pop at all. Maybe that's something that comes up in the later novels, and if so, I do hope that something that's covered in a future follow-up series. Particularly again with um, with Moon Knight having come out, with them possibly being oh, with how Moon Knight fared, maybe let's address one of adapt some of these later Boogie Pop stories that kind of get into Moon Knight territory and discuss things there. And oh yeah, and all I'm glad I watched the show, um and. We'll get into my thoughts of how this relates to Boogie Pop Phantom next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.